So this is from a recent paper. Well, not that recent, 2006, but that's, that's fairly recent. And what we're seeing here, morphology, seismic characteristics, and development of Cap Timorous or Timorous Canyon, offshore Mauritania, a newly discovered canyon preserved off a major arid climatic region. So they've discovered that there's this huge canyon system right off the coast where if you followed these fluvial forms where they would enter the ocean, there are submarine canyons. And uh, you can see this is marking it right here, which the recat structure just right up here. Um, let's go down to, so yeah, if, if we actually look at them, they are like submerged river systems that connect with, in other words, you follow those fluvial forms down and where they would enter into the ocean onto the coastal plain, they form these river valleys, mm. which is, again, strong evidence that, yes, there were tremendous floods that, that drowned this landscape at some point. Yeah, this is what, the, so this is like 3,000 meters down. Wow. Right. And this shows cross sections of the canyon. So I think there's a genetic connection then between the, the fluvial forms on land and the fact that there are these submarine canyons off the coastline. So I'm, to me then what that suggests is that you had this fluvial event or events that stripped away the overlying layers of rock to expose this core of this thing, which, which is, again, if you picture that it, that it domes up, the dome essentially picture a large pimple right? And then if you shear the top of it off, what's going to happen is you're going to see a ringed structure. Does that make sense? Yeah, because there's layers of like different layers that are being pushed up. So when you cut them off, you get rings to show each layer. Yeah, exactly. So now, is this Atlantis? Well, I would think that we're looking at a natural feature here. So it wasn't something that was constructed by humans. Let's go back to the, the hypothesis that we've been kind of developing here um, in these, in these uh, podcasts over the last four or five podcasts we're talking about. We're, we're hypothesizing that there may have been a fairly sophisticated, or a, I'll say a sophisticated maritime culture that there were islands in the mid-Atlantic that would have been ideal habitats for a culture to evolve during the ice ages. We tried to establish that, that there's nothing pseudoscientific about the idea. We tried to show that there was theoretical evidence and empirical evidence that there was considerable subsidence of along the mid-Atlantic ridge, that when you account for the, when you account for the rise of sea level and the, the isostatic subsidence of the sea floor, once you, it's not at all implausible that you had a large island complex in the mid-Atlantic Ocean. Now, assuming that you had a maritime culture evolving there, something along the lines of maybe a, a grand or Minoan or Phoenician civilization, it is certainly plausible that they could have had outlying colonies. This is nothing, there's nothing here, woo, about this, that we're, the, the model that we're developing here. We're not talking about, like, like Mike likes to say, you know, crystal spaceships or whatever. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about the ability, what Plato describes. Basically, lots of ships, lots of trade going on, and colonies. I mean, he basically describes that kind of a cultural scenario, right? So if we're accepting that as a working hypothesis, it would follow that it wouldn't be inconceivable at all that these people could have visited this structure. That's true. And yeah. we know that there were people there. I mean, we see Neolithic artifacts there that are 5,000 years old, and we see Acheulean artifacts there that are 250 to 300,000 years old and older. So this place has been visited and occupied by humans. So from that standpoint, could we surmise that perhaps it served as a model for a ringed structure that was constructed? Mm -hmm. That's not out of the question. Yeah, that, that's certainly feasible. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that this is a natural feature. It is not a constructed feature. Plato is describing a, see, 
part of the thing is, is he describes the island of Atlantis, 3,000 by 2,000 stadium. But then he describes the circular city structure, which you have to differentiate from the island itself, the large island, which would be 2,000 by 3,000 stadium. Now, given that a stade is generally, I think, 608 feet, give or take a few inches. And if you want to look that up, Kyle, stade or stadia. But so 3,000 stadia, that would be about 345 miles, which is, so that's 3,000 by 2,000. So if you then times that, so 345 times that by 0.666, you get about 228 miles. So interestingly, the dimensions 2,000 by 3,000 stade that he gives is, is roughly equivalent to the size of the Azores Plateau. Ah. Is in that same okay. scale, within that range. Okay, so again, his his he's not too far off in terms of his uh, his geography. Now, the city structure is something else again, and let's. I think we should just go back to to Plato himself for this, and uh, and see what he actually says about the city structure. And I will find that quote. I found stadium. Okay, let's see what it says. The, unit. Um, the stadium, formerly uh, also anglicized as stade, was an ancient okay. Greek unit of length based on the circumference of a typical sports stadium at the time. There we go. Okay. According to Herodotus, one stadion was equal to 600 Greek feet. Odes. Okay. <laughs> However, the length of the foot varied in different parts of the Greek world, and the length of the stadium has been the subject of argument and hypothesis for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Various hypothetical equivalent lengths have been proposed. But generally around 600 feet. 600 feet-ish, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 ba yeah. and based upon the, the length of the Greek foot, it actually has been refined by several metrologists right at 608 feet. It, for purposes of our uh, looking at, at scaling factors here, you know, 600 feet, 608 feet, 610 feet is, is fine. I think so, 612. <laughs> that's, that's what it should be. Yeah. 612. Okay. Because it's nine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so this is, this is what uh, Jawa translation of Plato says. First of all, they bridged over the zones of sea, which surrounded the ancient metropolis, making a road to and from the royal palace. At the very beginning, they built the palace in the habitation of the god and of their ancestors, which they continued to ornament in successive generations, every king surpassing the one who went before him to the utmost of his power, until they made the building a marvel to behold for size and for beauty. And beginning from the sea, they bored a canal of 300 feet in width and 100 feet in depth and 50 stadia in length, which they carried through to the outermost zone, making a passage from the sea up to this, which became a harbor, and leaving an opening sufficient to enable the largest vessels to find ingress. Moreover, they divided at the bridges the zones of land, which parted the zones of sea, leaving room for a single trireme to pass out of one zone into another. And they covered over the channels so as to leave a way underneath for the ships, for the banks were raised considerably above the water. Now the largest of the zones into which a passage was cut from the sea was three stadia in breadth, and the zone of land which came next of equal breadth. But the next two zones, the one of water, the other of land, were two stadia, and the one which surrounded the central island was a stadium only in width. The island in which the, the palace was situated had a diameter of five stadia. All this, including the zones and the bridge, which was the sixth part of a stadium in width, they surrounded by a stone wall on every side, placing towers and gates on the bridges where the sea passed in. The stone which was used in the work, they quarried from underneath the center island. Okay, so there again, the reference that we're talking about several islands here, a group of islands. Mm -hmm. And from underneath the zones, on the outer as well as the inner side, one kind was white, another black, 
and the third red. And as they quarried, that they, they at the same time hollowed out double docks, having roofs formed out of the native rock. Some of the buildings were simple, but others they put together different stones varying the color to please the eye and to be a natural source of delight. Now, what is all that describing? There it is. Okay, so we've got, as you see here, the outer ring of water is three stadia in width. Then you have a ring of land, which is three stayed. Then you have another ring of water, which is two stayed or stadia, ring of land, which is also two. Then a ring of water, which is one. And then the central island here that has the Temple of Poseidon on it um, is five stayed in width. The Temple of Poseidon itself is one stadium in length and one half in width. So it's a, a double square, which, you know, again, that's the same dimensions, the same proportions of the, say, the King's Chamber in the, in the Great Pyramid, uh, that double square. And the double square we as, know as geometricians is how you derive the golden section. Right. So I'm going to jump down here. Let's see, where do I have this? Um, here's the numbers. So we can get the dimensions here. If you figure across here, I'm using, as he says down here, I'm using the Greek state of 608 feet, which was almost certainly one of the variants of the state that was in use. Okay, so we yeah. can count, count here. We got 3, 6, 10, 11, then 22, plus the 5 is 27. So if we go 27 stades times 608, we get that it's 16,416 feet in diameter. We divide that by 5,280. So it's just 3.1 miles in diameter. That, that, and you know, if we use 600 feet, it would be somewhat um, smaller. Here's sort of a three-dimensional, very simplified, but it kind of shows the layout. You had the ocean, you had a great canal cut from the ocean that led into the ring structure. Then from there, it was bridged over so that this was how you could gain access to the various rings of land and ultimately get to the center uh, ring that contained the temple. So this can kind of give you the layout. Now, if this is literal, I mean, you know, I'm not going to say it is or I'm not going to say it isn't. Within our hypothesis, is it possible that they could have undertaken an infrastructure project on this scale? I'm not going to rule it out. Right. Why not? Why? It would have been, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously this was a, an enormous undertaking, but clearly we have overwhelming evidence that ancient peoples were capable of undertaking enormous Project. infrastructure projects. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no a priori reason to say, no, this is utterly impossible. Of course, we just don't know. We don't know at this point. We would have to find some remnant of this thing um, in order to determine uh, whether or not it was actually real or, or metaphorical. Or if they... So what I'm going to do now... Yeah, go ahead. Or if they were utilizing some uh, natural features on the Azores Plateau to basically make that kind of... Sure. Structure. Yeah. Sure. And here is the 3.1 mile city of a ringed center of Atlantis superimposed on the RECAT structure. Okay, yeah. It's, the RECAT's pretty big. <laughs> yeah, much, yeah. much, much bigger. Right. right. 